I was telling the story. I was in a place one day, and a manager came up to me and said, um, Quint, no one wants to work in my department. I said, why not? They said, well, you, nobody works harder than us. And it's really difficult. We work harder than anybody else in this whole place. And no one wants to work here. What should I do? I said, you've got to shut up. <laughs> Who's going to want to work there? And you tell them that. And I think cities fall into that same same trap. And, and not, not all the time, but it's a different messaging. It's not the message on when you pull in. It's the message that the Uber driver gives. It's the message that the normal person in the community says, like, we have a good this. We have a good that. This is a good place to, to live and so on. So did you want to add anything? Nope. Okay. So a couple things just to write down here. I, I wrote down, how, how do you currently support the stuff you want to support and if something's got to give what gives and you got two buckets here now I will tell you in traveling the country this buckets getting a lot more attention than this bucket right now mm -hmm. not saying for you we have to figure that out because there's so much competition here and there's so much empty of these here which commerce park tech park so it doesn't say it's wrong but it better be really you just can't no longer have a whole bunch of empty property, some cul-de-sacs, and think the whole bunch of people are coming at you. You gotta, like MG said, very targeted at what you wanna have there and how you're gonna do it. And hopefully, you know, can you utilize Eglin and some of these other places to, to kick off that or to a university. So let me get this thing right here. So let's just look at what you did last time. Um, we're going to review the plan, probably define great government, and, and I've been asked to do a little bit on change, which I'll do. Remember, this isn't the end-all, be-all. This is phase one. Now, if you know anything uh, you all do about strategic planning, it starts out very easy-looking, very focused, and then it gets real wide, and you think, oh, my gosh, and then by the time it's done, it narrows back down. So just, you know, it's like making sausage, and being a Wisconsin guy, you understand that. Um, you know, it's sort of like gets real complex, and then we, we bring it in. So this was your strategic plan, and these are your desired results. My only thing is you don't have a lot of measurement in it. It's sort of stuff that no one can disagree with, but how do you really measure um, affordable city to live and do business with? What are the metrics to say you're affordable? Um, proud to live in. Um, a safe city, um, a city that's successful from an economic quality of life. Um, so these are the desired results. Beautiful, attractive, open to positive change, city with accessible government, city with infrastructure, works well and has capacity. Every city, I mean, if you took Fort Walton Beach off of there, I can't imagine any community that isn't shooting for the same things. And nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, um, there you see um, some of the additions. Goals, continue to move forward with prior policies and investments have been made. Um, just out of curiosity, Michael, how, how would you rank yourself since 2017, which you're really smart. Some cities don't even have a strategic plan. You're, some people wait every five years. Here it's just two years out, you're moving so quickly, it's time to regroup, which is positive. H how would you say you've done with the forward movement policies and investments that have been made? I mean, I, I think we've made progress with, with because if, if you go further into the strategic plan with the strategies, mm -hmm. we actually put specific projects in there. Good. And I mean, we, we've made progress on all, but once again, we were not really focused. We just went 100 different directions and made small progress on 100 different projects instead of bringing one or two to the finish line and then worrying about the next one or two. I think that's real common and that's also not great is we go in a mile wide and an inch deep instead of sometimes should we go a little bit deeper but that's the hard part because then you've got to let a few things go and we have a real rough time letting things go in fact especially in, and not here but I, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs I'm the entrepreneur in residence at University of West Florida and, and their challenge is they want to do so many things it's always getting them to scope back and say, what's, what's the one or two things you can do? It's like, you know, a, a builder. You, you, sometimes you can't be experts in every type of construction. So, so where do you, where do you, yeah, <laughs> but where do you focus in on? Where, where, where do you go? So I think that focus, and we'll get into that. Um, is there any project policy, any investment 
that you feel you, you, you wish you had made a little more progress on, just out of curiosity? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Yeah, I'm just curious. Maybe the emergency operations, because I think that was one of our big things in 2017 was coming up with a you know way to address. Yeah, our, our emergency planning and management, um, we've, we've kind of, it's, it's kind of been on the back burner, and then we have Hurricane Michael hit now. We're we're scrambling, but but yeah, there there's some emergency operations, really public safety. I mean, there are some things we need to do there that we just we've been more focused on the public, the projects that have the public side instead of really internal. Uh, okay, um, develop significant new features that will make the city even more attractive to visitors, business, or residents. What were some of those? And maybe it's in here somewhere. Is this it? Yeah, these are, these are the uh, specific yeah. issues. You feel pretty good about Jet Stadium parking, tennis center, operational plan? Yeah, we took care of Jet Stadium parking. It's <laughs> gone. <laughs> hmm? but, but we have. We, we've, we've done a lot of work on all those. Okay. Um, diversification? support neighborhood development efforts that's kind of a we didn't really have a lot to do with that that's really builders and developers doing that uh, but yeah we uh, like I said we've done work on all of them all of them we just haven't really what's, what's the most successful private public partnership you've done since this I would say downtown parking is okay. one of them. And then we just partnered with a private developer for Freedom Beacon Park, which is a 50-acre mixed-use development that just broke ground. OK. And I'm just asking, if you don't mind, just to learn a little bit. Uh, marketing efforts. You hired this guy over there, right? Yeah. That was all <laughs> progress. Um, internet bandwidth. You know, that's really interesting. And you bring this up, because when we travel the country, this is probably the number one issue most small. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I just was going to reiterate. Um, I had a chance to talk to a few citizens as I was walking around, and one of the things that they brought up was that the, the need for fiber optic bandwidth to attract um, high tech companies that need that bigger pipe. Uh, so I, I was glad to see that up there. Yeah, well, I. In particular, things like online learning, where it requires a lot That's of bandwidth biggie. for streaming, companies are saying we're having a hard time training our people. We send them other places, which then gets the revenue for you know the uh, hotels and that sort of thing. But what we find to be the most true is that people aren't. We're not looking for giant, big broadband in some of these communities. We're looking for really good, solid, basic um, internet structure, and they don't have it, and they don't realize it because they've gotten so used to really bad connections. The biggest complaint we hear today is so many adults and young people do their learning online. They go to college online, some go to high school online, some businesses training is almost online, and they can't do it in small communities because the connectivity is such a, such a challenge. So um, I think that's the new bridge, that's the new road, that's the new infrastructure is connectivity. How would you rank your connectivity now? Well, that is one of the biggest complaints we get. And I will say during the Commerce Park Master Plan, almost all the stakeholders had that complaint. And unfortunately, we have one provider in the area. And unfortunately, they're not proactive. And we, we've been sitting down at the table with them to try to... And you have no choice but to use them, is that right? No, it, it's, it's not that. We're, we've opened the door to other companies, and we're trying to figure out why they're not coming into the market. But we, okay. we're, we, we haven't progressed that far into the discussion yet. Okay. Help, help me, if you don't mind, because um, I know one of the things cities are trying to do is not sit on vacant land anymore, because vacant land doesn't do much for you. And I'm not talking about your 32 parks, so you might want to develop a few of them. Anyway, so, but, but yeah, that, that's always, see, I thought, 
Now we have so many parks and cities and they're empty half the time, but if when you mention development people, that's that closing the school conversation because they've been there for so long and I bought my house because across the street there was never going to be anything else. I get that, but this is a big issue with cities having more land than they need and they're so afraid to let it go unless they get a certain price, yet what's going to happen to it? Where, where are you at that one? We've actually, when we consolidated our recreation center, we put all the old properties on the market and actually sold all of them to try to put money away to end up actually paying the balloon payment when it comes up. But we have actually done a pretty good job of getting rid of surplus properties. Now, we've acquired some in the well, downtown. I was going to go now, The I'm you know schizophrenic here, so I'm now going to say why you have to buy stuff in a few seconds. <laughs> well, and, and in the downtown area, we have purchased properties, have uh, whether strategic purchases or purchase to do parking but there there is going to come a point with this downtown master plan either the city's going to have to make a move to consolidate properties or we would rather the private side do it but we may normally in in this area the city is the one taking the first step and that's a, something that we have to cover before we end this process is when do you make those decisions and let me explain with research the, probably the biggest city we did our research in was Asheville. And people look at Asheville today and they think it's this great city. When, when I went there in 2004 or 5 to study, Asheville, study cities, everybody said, you got to go to Asheville. So I went to Asheville and I was heavily depressed. Well, I saw this great city and I compared it to where I lived and there was a huge, huge gap. It's like my wife comparing me to like Brad Pitt or something, you know, there's a gap there. And anyway, um, and, and not, well, maybe not that big a one, right? <laughs> but, but anyway, but anyway, um, but they showed me pictures of what it looked like in like the 1980s, boarded up buildings, um, empty things. And, and here's what they told me, which was really, really difficult. And they were lucky. They had Pat Whalen. And Pat Whalen was a wealthy guy who wanted to have a great downtown. And what they talked about is you've got to control the property, either from a, a good private citizen or a public entity, because if you don't control key property and it goes to the wrong use, it can kill a city for five, 50 years, 30 years, 10 years. If you want to see an example of that, go online and hit Janesville, Wisconsin, um, graft, G-R-A-F-T. And I'm just counting there in a fight right now because over the years he's bought a lot of property downtown. You can't blame him. He bought a lot of property downtown and the people sold it to him because it was available. The challenge is he doesn't have the funds to fix the property up. So the property gets worse and worse and worse. And the challenge is some of that old buildings are in the prime location of the community and now they've got to figure out what to do. And some of it is even, if you don't put this much money in, we're tearing it down. You know, it, it's dangerous now. So I think even though I sit here and say, get rid of some property, you might, as a community at times in a city, have to strategically purchase some properties or else they will just completely stop your development. Does that make, make sense? And that's this yin or yang that you're gonna have to make decisions because, and that's particularly true in a, in a downtown. You, you, you might have to purchase some property to consolidate it, to do some things with it, um, to open up some things, and, and you might not. You might get such so hot that private developers want to come in, but that's the other thing. It's really your codes and your overlay district type things, and um, not, not every developer or contractor likes this. It, maybe they will, but you've got to have guidelines on what you are going to allow and what you're not going to allow or everything that fits doesn't work. And I'm a big, every, every person from we've studied had a form-based code in and they had overlay districts in. Now, that's where city councils need strong legs because that's where you get the pushback. I'm not saying you have to or don't have to. What do you have right now in place? We, we have, in a, our only overlay district, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, is downtown. Yes. Okay. And, and, and we did that five, six years ago Smart. 
to create an entertainment business and entertainment right. district. Um, and I will say one of the recommendations in, in the final plan is going to be res be restrictive, get more restrictive. In 2012, when we changed our code, we opened it up to everything. Now it's time to really close it back down and, and really, I hate to use the word dictate, but you're almost dictating what what types of development goes in. Yeah, downtown. not all development is good. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it might be good, but it's what location is it in. Because with a downtown, you want to create foot traffic. And you, you want to create density. And that's the other controversial thing. You know, people panic when you talk density, especially when you live in a community like, like where there is a lot of density outside here. Yet at times, density is very good for storm water. It's very good for the environment because it takes less space and it goes up versus sprawl. And that's sometimes a little bit controversial too. But those are the, those are the, your success is gonna create more pressure on you to make these type of decisions. Because I think as you get more attractive to development, more attractive to investment, now you have to make some of these tougher decisions on what do we allow and what don't we allow. Well, you don't have any height limits downtown, do you? Only the um, 120 feet. It's yeah. based on Eglin's mission. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you might be limited on that. At least you can blame somebody besides yourself. So, but um, we, we, ours, ours is 70. So they're go we're going through that right now in Pensacola. Because, you know, we are very excited that somebody might want to put a nine-story residential unit downtown. Okay? Um, but it, that means it's going to have to get a variance and then watch what happens when that shows up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But if you look at it financially and where it is with land, it takes it makes some sense. And also people want to get up high enough to look over the town now and look over the, to see the water. So, but I'm not saying these are just, the, this is the consequences of, of success, consequences of creating a community that you can even have these conversations. You've had some really good, I was very impressed with um, the DOT money that's coming at your way. Everybody's aware of that, right? Yes, and, and just if you're not, with, with the downtown master plan and around the mound concept, we've worked closely with DOT. They stepped forward late last year and pledged 700000 out of the 750000 All we had to do was provide the remaining 50000 as a local match. That agreement was signed in January. We wired the money last week to DOT, so that study should kick off any day now. And what's the goal of that again, just for me? It's the feasibility study and they're gonna look at corridor, different corridors to determine what the best route is for around the mound. Um, make sure it can be done, mm -hmm. ha what the effects of, on traffic it will have and, and uh, it'll take about a year to complete. And then after that, DOT will make their recommendations and our goal is to get it, move, move it forward. Yeah, a um, couple other, Go ahead, John. In, in my humble opinion, the, um, the sorry, in my, in my opinion, that's going to be the real change that happens downtown is the around the mound because I think it'll primarily come from state funds. I, d I know that we have a, a plan we're implementing for the downtown master plan, but I don't know that I see us spending twenty, thirty million dollars doing it. What I what I think. What I, what I see happening is, is this around the mound concept happening, creating more of a destination for the downtown, and this plan that we're creating, we use that as a guideline to um, push forward the development that, that Mr. Beatty was just talking about. So we, we have kind of a rubric, this is what we would like to see happen there. But I think that this state-funded DOT around the mound, I think that's what's really going to make the change, not the city buying and rebuilding the that, that's the home run yes in my mind if you can get that that's the wow that's the transformational change that you'd want I also think when you look at things and I again sometimes if you can do it in phases if the phases work because the real goal is to get private investment I mean that, that's really what you're shooting for is to do enough to attract the private investment so you don't have to do any more because the private investment takes it over. Does that, is, would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, and that's what you want to do. And I was telling Mike, um, 
our, our, Michael, our, our, our CRA now is flush, and one of the recommendations you'll see in the book is to close that one down and move it over to where it needs to be. And a lot of times, you know, people don't want to give up that, but those are some of the decisions y you'll make down the road. But the goal is to get um, good, good investment, not investment, but the smart intellectual investment that you want that fits your overall plan, which is create tax revenue, attract people, create better jobs, and improve quality of life. I mean, when I look at the four things that I've heard from you over and over and over again. So I said basically get rid of property and buy property. <laughs> Sound like an attorney, don't I? Like every, every, time, every time I have an attorney, I say, what do you think? He says, well, I, I could go here, and then I could go here, and then he's right. <laughs> yeah. um, invest in safer city. Um, develop specific plans addressing vagrancy and challenges of chronic homeless. homeless. If you can do that, you can sell that to the rest of the United States right now. Uh, tell us about that, because that's the biggest, when we go to cities right now, and, and I'm, I'm going to say both these words, but I'm not saying they're the same. It's homelessness and panhandling. Yes. And, you, you, and that's another thing you have to have strong legs within, um, but both of those, but people commingle them. And then some group jumps at you for doing this to these poor homeless people when you're, it's different. But I, I'm just saying from a messaging point of view, to separate, the, you'll read this in the book, is just vital. We want to talk about that. We we've been a huge partner in in this. We donated land pretty much to a, a group, and they've developed the first phase of a homeless shelter. That you have, and <laughs> we are now living, but <laughs> <laughs> we are now working on funding for phase two. Okay, so I donated some uh, books there on um, great employee handbook, how to be a good employee, how to work this. So I've actually donated some things. There. But that addresses. The homeless homelessness issue, not mm -hmm. the vagrancy issue, mm -hmm. and we were actually improving on vagrancy, but however, with Hurricane Michael, we've seen a, a new influx uh, um, in our area, so we're having to deal with that now. But that's that's been an ongoing what, issue. What's for the difference years. between vagrancy, for my sake, and panhandling? It's just terminology. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I I think I I will say um, my wife and I. Years, year, uh, years ago, I was working for, in a healthcare system just as a consultant in Santa Barbara. I had never been to Santa Barbara. I, I, has anybody ever been to Santa Barbara? It's unbelievable. So I, I, I call her and I said, this is unbelievable. I feel like I'm in a movie set uh, out here. So about two years ago, I was very excited because I got put on the board of Betty Ford, which is out there in Rancho Mirage, but we went sort of got there early and we're going to drive up the coast, go to Santa Barbara, and then head over. Santa Barbara was very difficult to walk around downtown because there's so much panhandling there. You couldn't almost walk. I got to the point where I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back there today. Um, now, that's, again, that's the big challenge. That when, that's what success breeds. Success always breeds these types of things. It's sort of like... You're gonna, you know, everybody wants a great re entertainment section, so you keep young people here, right? right. Oh, except one group. Tracy, you know what that group might be? <laughs> it's a rough police, it, it channels, you know, the police department. Now you've got to put more, more people down looking at that area. Not wrong or right, but it also attracts more intoxication. So, so some other things. So again, there's nothing perfect. Even the best of things have unintended consequences. It's sort of like when you get to a community and they're complaining about parking, traffic, and gentrification, you're doing good things. Not that these are positive things, but it means more people are coming there, more people want to be there, and it means values are going up, which is the gentrification. Now, do you have to deal with gentrification? Yeah. But if you never have it, it means you're not building anything and your values are low. So I'm just saying, it's like I went to the doctor one time and I said, I had a cold and he's going to give me a prescription. And I said, give me one without any side effects, won't you? And I was naive. He said, there is no such thing. You ever watch the commercials on TV and wonder why you would take anything? <laughs> you know, oh, take this. It's going to help your life. You could die. You could bleed to death. You'll have diarrhea for the next five years. Um, you, know, you know, they scare the heck out of you. You know, why would you take it? Um, how about this public safety? 
we we've improved on community policing uh the second one that's not going to happen the sheriff's department and school board have a partnership for school resource okay so you can get rid of that but okay. we're we're hoping to get our foot in the door some in other ways to to let everyone know hey the city has a police force to get 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 engaged with the children and and but the good news is that you're not paying for something that the sheriff's department's paying right. for. I think that's right. positive. I'd ask him to do a whole bunch of other things, too. Anyway, um, investigative capacity. Go ahead. Going back to the school resource officer program, um, my kids obviously go to school here, and they have a school resource officer there that I talk to frequently. He's actually really big in the um, SRO program, Officer Colin, I'm sure. And so one of his things that I was talking to him recently was, not necessarily the taking over by another police department, but the interoperability in his in his opinion was kind of the lack of training because it's not going to be just the sheriff's office that responds to these incidents. It's not going to be just you know You're Mary right. Esther's fire department that's close over there at Ocean City. It's going to be all of these agents having the ability to train with and, and learn these classrooms and learn these buildings because they're all different. And if you've never been in one, especially some of these that are larger it's very easy to get you know disorientated and, and not know what's Absolutely. going on and in, in an event whether it's you know any kind of thing where there's a lot going on it's very easy to get lost and it's very easy to have stuff just kind of nobody knows what's going on if you haven't trained properly for these things and you haven't done these in these down times where you can go okay well that doesn't work how do we fix that versus in the moment where you don't have that opportunity so i think getting city resources in these schools and, and learning these things can really help out a lot. Well, you know, Tracy, if you don't mind, um, because I'm sure after Parkland, I mean, isn't that what we're talking about yeah, in a way? A one, after, yeah. after that, are we prepared? How do we handle it? What do we do? And, and I think that's why training is so vital. And, I, and again, I think it's, uh, I'm glad you don't cut that because I think if you don't train, and if you read this report, you're going to be sort of stunned at, um, in Pensacola, how they pulled training of police and fire out of the budget for the last eight years. And that's very strong in there that that's got to come back. We can't sacrifice it. You want to talk about what's happened? So you're absolutely right. And, and to kind of piggyback off what Mr. Beatty said earlier, it's like the Hurricane Michael. We always talk about training. How's that Hurricane usually, Michael Beatty? Right now. No. <laughs> So we always talk about training, but it's after something comes up, like yes. Parkland. So we do have a good working relationship with the sheriff's office. We do train with them. Uh, honestly, it's mostly our, our SWAT team trains with their SWAT team. But w we do go into schools. We have a map of all the schools and the interior. And if a situation occurs, obviously the sheriff's office abuts to most of our, our jurisdictional boundaries. We're all going to respond. Whoever's the closest is going to respond and go in, whether it's in that area or not so I think that's good messaging though because I think that's a huge concern for anybody that's got a child in school today because they have the alert system now locked down and are we prepared for that in our local community right and, and that's changing nationwide too you know where it used to be going into school something it was you waited for three to go and now it's first on scene goes in because you know you're preserving life and, and that so to go back on you, the sheriff's office absolutely has the school resource officers. They train well together. They're statewide. They get certifications and they get awards every year. So that is a good group together. But we do go into the schools at times, even for a little bit as reading to the students and things. And it just shows the different. Th kids. That's what we find. What what police need more than anything is positive interaction when there's not an emergency. Correct. You know that's why. The Blue Wahoos have been a great thing for the, the, the police because they're always there and it's always positive. Um, you know, we do, they do all sorts of things, neighborhood gifts, reading. I, I think that's the vital part so people feel good about the police. It is, and just when we show up or when the officers show up, it's not to take somebody to jail. It's, hey, right. to play basketball or do stuff. So the community policing effort is, is nationwide, but we're really attacking it here in the city and trying to get the Are you pretty pleased with what you're doing in the city? We are. We are. We have a uh, right now a, a six-man unit for community policing that kind of get out there and, and just get back into the neighborhoods. Yeah, and people want boots on the ground. Right. Absolutely. Can you talk about High Five Fridays and biking to school, those two programs? Uh, I'm sorry, on the second part I didn't hear? The, the riding bikes to school, you do at Elliott Point. 
Yes, yeah, so so different schools in the area, and this started a couple years back. It was the High Five Friday. So every Friday, we'll get a group of officers, even our civilian staff, and go to the school and, and basically just high five all the kids who come up, the parents, the teachers. You know, it kind of scares everybody at first when they see, you know, 15 cops out there in front of their school. But now that it's kind of caught on, we go to the different schools within the city. The school resource officers are there, and they help as well. Everybody loves it. I know city staff has came, Mr. Beatty, the mayor, council. Everybody showed up at different times, and absolutely it spreads the word hugely that we get out there and do that. Uh, riding the bikes to school is the same thing. The kids see that positive interaction with us, cops on bicycles, um, cops talking to them, throwing Frisbees, footballs, and things like that. So. That's cool. And, and um, not, not to name this person employee of the year because they haven't started till Monday. And I always say you have to be real careful, Mike, because uh, um, sometimes when we hire someone, we promote them and make such a big deal about them. And then if they're not that good, we say, oh, crud, what can I do? Because I've just positioned them great. But everything you've heard about your new police chief is pretty positive. So far, we haven't had much interaction, but uh, speaking with even city staff and uh, that during the hiring process, you know, when they narrowed it down to him, it was, it was all good stuff. Uh, even some of our officers, as you can imagine, when we get a new police chief or somebody, they well, go I was to telling Google. Tracy, as you know what happens, as soon as they find out who it is, the police call some policeman down there and say, how is this guy or lady? What's it like? And you can say references, you can say all you want, but your staff is going to call their staff and say, what's this person like? Absolutely, and that's what's happened. And some people that don't have to say what they feel, yes. they've actually been honest and said, hey, the guy's a great guy. In case he's watching, he's a great guy. So, <laughs> uh, but no, truthfully, we've got all good information. So we're looking forward to him coming Monday. Can you hand this to little daddy? Oh, okay. That's just so the Facebook and everybody's a, a watching good, you. A good way to think about positive police messaging is to always think about what's top of mind for people and what's worrying them. And school safety is a huge one. I think maybe two years ago when the um, the the school shooting was handled poorly, they thought by the maybe the local police department. I can't remember what all the details were, but you know it really really decimated the morale in that department for sure. And I don't know if they handled it right or not. I don't know anything about it. But the other thing I would say that you just happened to mention in passing uh, that I thought was really interesting is how you're dealing with all the mental health issues that you're having to deal with and the opioid crisis, which are two things that are top of mind for people. We're seeing in our communities more and more, you know, kind of mental health issues. And, and he talked about how he sends the same officer out every time so they know how to deal with that particular person. That's an important thing to be narrating to the community because it really shows a thoughtfulness on your part for solving the problem, not just locking people up and taking them to jail, which solves nothing. And you know, we also talked a little bit about suicide and how you're handling those calls. So I, I think when you want to think about messaging, think about what's bothering people and back yourself into it and thinking about what you're doing. You know, be authentic. You are dealing with it in, in a way that's um, authentic, but I would say think about what's bothering them and back into it. Nice stuff. Well, and, and I don't want to paint a rosy picture that we're <laughs> providing all the training that everybody no, needs because, because when times were rough in 08 and 09, training was the first thing that was cut. And we are just now getting back to the point where we're adding, adding enough back in to get the proper training, but it's, it's taken, a, taken a while to get to that point. So one of my recommendations as we go along by the time we're done is the city council have a very good report card on how much training is needed so you can track it and monitor it because that's some short-term decisions and just to be aware of, okay, if we're reducing training, help us understand why we're reducing it because that's when you lose people, when you don't train them and they don't feel prepared on the job. They don't feel ready for the job, and that's when you lose people. And, you know, people don't think about that, but you lose people, cause especially young people. Young people today are more interested in training and development than sometimes some, some other things because um, they, they want to be skilled. And um, the other thing to know is this is the first generation of people, which I think can play real well when you do these things, is um, where people will pick a community and then find a job versus find a job and pick a community. 
And, and that's why also working on such things as what are you doing as a city to attract entrepreneurs? What are you doing to a city to make it a good place for startup companies to work or companies to grow? And I'll, I'll go real quick on this. 2004 5, the Gallup Company did the biggest study ever done on why some communities thrive and some don't. And what they found out is those communities that thrive do these things. Number one, they know which companies are getting their revenue from outside of the city or the community, and they stay real close to them. Because those are the people that can move. You know, your, your hospital's not going to move because you've got people here. There are certain people that you want to treat them well, but it's those people that get their revenue from outside this area that, that could be anywhere. And how are you making sure that they're, they're happy, comfortable, and so on? The second part is finding funds for startup. Um, we've been real fortunate. In the last four or five months, I've gotten to know um, the Walton family. Stuart and Tommy Walton are Sam Walton's grandsons. They had something called the Heartland Summit, and they invited 300 people from around the country to go to it. And I got lucky because uh, a woman that works for me for years, son lives in Bentonville, and he rides bikes with Stuart Walton. And he said, here, here's this guy's book on building a vibrant community. You should read it. And he read it, and he liked the brain bag the most, by the way. And he invited me, just threw me on the guest list. But I got to look and see what communities are doing and figuring out ways to attract entrepreneurs or young people and keep them, whether it's co-work space, whether it's training, whether it's funds, is, is got to go there. And the third component of why do some cities thrive and some don't was the downtown. And here's what made a great downtown, and you talked about it, John, programming. One of the first things we do today when we go into a community is say, do you have a full-time programmer? Because usually it's somebody's part-time job if they have time and they're not doing other things. Because people want activities. They just don't, they just don't want to go downtown to go downtown. They, they want activities. I'm sure you had it here. I, I could barely get out of my office yesterday because they had a pop-up parade yesterday. Somebody just said, we're going to do a pop-up Mardi Gras parade downtown. And they closed off the streets and they just did this pop-up. Somebody planned that. Just, a, you know, it's sort of like um, spontane planned spontaneity, I call it. Um, the s next thing they do is they, once you get your programming, people come downtown, they, they really find the people most attracted to you are talking about, John, opening up shops are not your franchises. They're not going to go there. There's not enough foot traffic. It's your, your new startups, your entrepreneurs. Your, your wife, I think, has a shop, right? Um, something like that. But the challenge is they won't make it if you don't program it enough to get people downtown. And then what are you doing to train them? So I think when you look at it, I'm not saying you have to do this, but the city has to figure out who's doing it. Who's training these small business people so they're successful? Because 80% of them will not make it a year, and 80% of those that make it a year will not make it five years. So cities have to take some type of ownership in training and development of these startups, or they just won't make it. The third component is decent office space downtown. Can people find a decent office space? And I will tell you, cities think they have decent office space, but they don't. Only when they get it and do they find it. And the fourth one is the toughest one. It's that residential. It's, it's that residential because that stabilizes a, a community. But people don't want to live downtown if there's nothing to do, nothing to shop, and, and no place to work. Now, if, if you had a lot of money, like the Waltons, you would just do, lead with residential and just bite the bullet because the rest of the stuff will come. But who's got that type of funds where you can take losses for that many years? So I get into this because as we talk about these things, they're, they're all interconnected. I go back to where we have to end up with is, what are the core services that are a must-have? That if worst case scenario, we've got to make sure we fund those. What are other services that are nice to have? But if we had to make some choices, what would you rather have? Would you rather have this? Or would you rather have that? Would you rather have this? Or you rather have some of this? Or would you rather take some of this and put it more into some of that? Th those are the, the what we'll walk through. The third one is the future. And the future is, OK, we got this forward momentum, but we have some, you have some really good plans. But 
I'm not sure you can find 80 million bucks laying around. So how, how, if you had to prioritize, just how do we prioritize? And then the fourth thing I'd like to walk away with when we're done is a decision matrix, the decision tree. So when people come in, it ties into, does it create jobs? Is it sustainable? Does it improve property tax? You know, does it impact the quality of life? And I don't know where we'll get, but we'll get there. And we'll get there where you'll all agree on the matrix, and then the city council needs to put point systems on that. So you say, I'm just making this up. Well, this is an 80-pointer, and this is a 60-pointer. So even though the 60-pointer sounds good, it's, it's not an 80-pointer. And sometimes you have to make those types of decisions. You're, you're in construction. If you're really, really busy, you're going to make different decisions than if you're not busy. Yes. And some of it's going to be based on margin. Yes. Yeah. You're going to say no. You're going to say no. And you've had to learn to say no. Now, there's always fear of no that, you know. Next year, there won't be no. Right, right. <laughs> but you've got to make those tough decisions. And I think because you're, uh, and I think I like Fort Walton Beach because you look upon this money as your money. There are too many government entities that look upon government money as not their money. I was, we were in a city that um, they had an, an independent contractor that went way over his original bid. And then he showed up and said, well, I went way over my original bid, but I'd like you to pay me what I did. And they all voted to pay him. Now, I wonder if that was their own money, if they would have done that. I'm not sure they would or they wouldn't. But we're, not play we're playing with other people's money or our money. And I think sometimes when there's government money, we'll spend it because it's government money. But then if we can't sustain it and operationalize it, it's just not worth it. So this, this is where we want to go. This is, in my mind, listening to all of you. And we'll change it if you want to change it. We, we work for you. I just um, wanted to uh, piggyback real quick on this idea that people, young people now are picking the community that they want to live in first and then finding a job, which is a new trend um, that's, that's not been in place before. Um, and Quint talks about this all the time. He didn't mention it this time, but I've always thought it was interesting how communities always parade themselves around as being shovel ready. And he says, everybody's shovel ready. You have to be talent ready. And meaning if you get the talent in your community, the business will come. And the way you get the talent in your community is to be a great place to live, and that usually the, a great downtown is the heart of that. So I think that's a good way to change your thinking and um, you know, get, attracting good people to live here, and the business will follow. And I talked to the mayor just briefly about incentives for small businesses which is something people don't do as often you know they tend to incentivize big companies but small businesses sometimes have to have some incentives too and I know that you've done some good things in that direction which I think is also worth messaging. A Asheville had something called BizWorks and it was a small little entity that trained and could give some small loans and they created 1500 jobs almost and I mean here's a loan I'm a cosmetologist and I have one chair, but I'd like to have a second chair, but I can't afford the second chair. Um, and nobody will loan me money for a second chair. Well, BizWorks would loan them the money for the second chair and put some assets on it. But they really, based on that 60 80% jobs were organic. And where the story came from, well, I was in a community talking, and they had a big billboard because they're on the interstate. And it said, shovel-ready land, shovel-ready land, shovel-ready land. While I was there, um, I asked what their high school graduation rate, and this is a state with pretty high education, and they said we're at 90, 93%, we're a little concerned because we were 94. Now I'm sitting in a city that's 66, and now I think we're up to maybe 70 or 80, but you will worry you know, how, how you get so quick so fast. But um, I said I'd change the billboard out. <laughs> I'd put you got talent, because that's what people are looking for. So they ended up attracting a 500, uh, 500 employee logistic company. And it wasn't the land. The land was nice. They gave them a sweet deal on the land. But they wouldn't have moved there just for land. What they moved there, the fact that they felt they could hire the 500 employees that they were going to hire there. So I, I think it was talent ready, what you were talking about. They were very vital 
to, to where you're where, where you're going we we have another community where we uh, they've been very successful in attracting the business but the people don't want to live there they're driving 30 minutes away and so what they're leaving on the table by people not wanting to work in that community because there's nothing to do so. yeah when um, one of the local companies has been generationally owned forever like grand grandfather started it my dad had it and I had it and they've always had CEOs and this is the first time ever their CEOs not going to live in the community because he said I just don't want and he's going to live a half hour away why school districts great downtown somewhere I think it's been called somewhere it's in Georgia so how about EMS transport that was something we tried to <laughs> partner with the county on and they just that weren't, work? Okay. They weren't interested When we looked at the EMS transport at the time, it's been a couple of years ago now, it was almost a sense of self-preservation. Mm -hmm. uh, the county was going through a very, very difficult time uh, staffing their EMS units, and, mm -hmm. and so we would sit on scene for long periods of time waiting for an ambulance. Um, since that time, they've, they've got some new leadership, uh, and, and they, they have done some stuff that's bolstered that a little, so it's not... This is something that's not as important as it was so, at the time so when we this, came up with this. This could probably drop off. That's correct, it. yes. Good. Some, that's good. All right. Uh, monitoring, so probably the same thing with it. How about our advanced life support system and transport? Because I believe when we talk that we provide that for other fire districts other than ourselves. Is that a correct statement? We, we provide advanced. We provide advanced life support service for the residents of the city. We will do it for mutual aid outside the city uh, if it's something that we run. Um, one of the areas I think maybe what you're talking about is the west side of the city over in the over in the Commerce and Technology Park. Um, we are not the first response or second response fire department in that area. We rely on Mary Esther to provide medical services, and they do not provide ALS over there. So. Those, those residents of businesses are getting a BLS service rather than, than the ALS service that we provide. All right, thank you. Um, invest in safer city, improve civic relationship with cities, support Okaloosa, Walton County, physically divert vigils for mental health. Can you talk about that one? Is that still an issue? It is an issue, and in fact, we have a meeting in May to address that. We, unfortunately for two years, the city and Okaloosa County didn't see eye to eye on a solution, but we are now on the same page. And so we, the county is taking the lead on this instead of us, Good. which, which they should have done yeah. in the first place. But we, we are fully supporting them now. And Sometimes you do something just to get somebody else to do what they should do. You know, but it doesn't mean you have to do it forever. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, because I think what we're saying from the beginning is Fort Walton Beach can't be the be-all, end-all, to-all, for-all. You, you've got to figure out what you can, what you can play the lead role in, what you need to be at the table, and what you can let go. Um, how about examine best practice youth council reinstitute? We've looked at it, but haven't really taken it anywhere. You have to wait for me to get off the seat. <laughs> Pardon? Once I step down at the end of my term, then I'll be working on getting the youth council. All right. All right. Good, Amy. Um, fire assessment fee study? We, we actually brought that to council a year and a half ago. Three. three. Or three. Yeah. Wow, it's been that long. Did it get and approved? It, it did not get approved. What would, what would have, why would, did you recommend it? Because obviously you wanted it approved. What we were looking for, we had just come out of the, the economic downturn, and obviously that hit all the services. It hit the fire department like it did the rest. The, the, uh, the assessment fee is a way that's in Florida that you can legally do just a flat assessment, um, and you can do it for fire protection because it benefits real property. So what we were looking at diversifying the way that we are funded uh, rather than strictly relying on ad valorem and general fund, but do an assessment that is more predictable, uh, it doesn't fluctuate with the economy and with property values, and therefore we may not find ourselves in the same predicament that we did in, in 07 and, and, and 08. Why, why didn't the council vote yes, Mayor? But we're on the ballot. Were you, huh, no, John? I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's, 
And I just want to have I'm, these I'm type not, of adult conversations. And, not, and, and don't take this as sarcastic, but it's it's like the stormwater fund. Uh, it was it was probably not fun to to pass when it went through, but it was nice to have that consistent funding for the stormwater. Mm -hmm. um, the the position we're in is we represent the people who elect us, mm -hmm. and uh, although individually I may not have an issue with that consistent funding. Uh, I, I know I didn't support it because I, I know that the people that elected me and the people that I represent saw it as an additional tax and an additional uh, burden on, on them, the churches, and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's not a simple subject and not a simple solution. It's, sure. a, it's a great concept, but the people, I, I don't, in my humble opinion at the time, did not support it. So maybe with more education uh, down the road, maybe it would be a, a different idea. Mike, I, I and, and John's right. It, it when we presented it three years ago, there were still a lot of unanswered questions, I get it. and it really wasn't. There wasn't an additional service getting provided right. for the assessment. Now, if we were to present it today, we would actually have a, a, a better argument. Well, let um, me ask another question about your city, um, churches. Is the hospital in your city? No, they want to be, but they're not. Okay, well, they don't pay. They're, they're for profit, though, aren't they? They are. So they at are. least they pay taxes, right? Because yes. one of the great challenges, as many communities, is there's so much that people that don't pay taxes. I mean, I'm just talking about Escambia County. Eight of our ten biggest employers don't pay taxes, per se. You know, Navy Federal, um, hospitals, um, government, school. Um, and, and sometimes you still have to provide them services, right? Do they pay something, though? Do they pay fire, police? Do they pay something? They, they do not, no. Okay. That was one of the things that came out at actually in that fire assessment. We have a lot of those properties. Well, some communities are doing that. And, and what I meant, uh, as I travel, some communities are saying, we, because you're going to get police and fire, we do need you to pay something to help do that because you're a big player in, in this community. So you're starting to see that conversation happen. And that was one of the reasons for the fire assessment. We have, uh, I don't know if it's 10 or 15 percent of our properties don't pay ad valorem. Right. And the fire assessment, you can actually assess those properties. Uh, but it's a tough decision for the elected officials to make. Yeah. Well, you're seeing it in hospitals today. Now, you, you have a for-profit hospital, which is, means they won't. But when you got these giant not-for-profit entities that are sometimes too billion dollar op companies um, you know that use a lot of resources you're sort of seeing that conversation happen in a, in a community and some of them are actually coming up and offering it because what happens is some governments are questioning should they be not-for-profit because you know your CEOs making a million bucks this that this so they start questioning should you maintain your not-for-profit status? And once somebody questions that, they start saying, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we pay for this or pay for that? And it's just have Illinois, because uh, again, Illinois has been forced to have these decisions because of their poor financial condition. They're looking, I'm not saying it's wrong or right. It's just these types of conversations are taking place around the country. Well, and the other reason we look at things like this, alternate revenue sources, mm -hmm. is because every year the state tends to take away yeah uh, whether it's another homestead exemption if it's a an unfunded mandate or, and, or and we're, at, we're at the bottom we, we can't go anywhere else well or or if the fact that even if you um, and fix up your property they can only raise your property tax this much mm -hmm. even though it could you know you're limited aren't you yes three percent three percent when sometimes like we we benefited from that We've gone in and put big money into projects, and we're surprised our property tax hasn't gone up more, but they're limited to 3%. Um, how about last part, broader development areas visible, update the CRA plan? So we're in the final stages of updating our CRA plan. We do that every five years, complete a major CRA project. We've been doing really the biggest projects we've done is parking. We're about to renovate our landing park, which will be a huge four million dollar project downtown it's it's kind of taken off on its own that's cool that, uh, I mean that's what you want I mean you want to sort of prime the pump then you want to be able not to have to prime it because it starts going on on its own 
CRA district, we are recommending to expand our CRA district. Mm -hmm. uh, Commerce Technology Park, we're finalizing that plan. I think it'll be done by the early summer. Oh, yeah. And then CRA for Hollywood Boulevard, I believe that's one of the expansion areas that, okay. that our consultant is recommending. Okay. How about this one? Create a master plan. Yeah, we really, <laughs> we've done the downtown well, and commerce part. Is that that, what you that really goes, goes along with that. We did start linking our agenda items to the strategic plan. I, th I think we've done a good job of that, but I think we need to get more focused and really nail down. If it doesn't meet one of the strategies, it doesn't yeah, go. And, and I find people get so emotional if you act like it's a no. Sometimes you just have to say, we're going to park this for a while. You know, we're not ready for this now. We're not saying no, never, but we're going to park it right now because dog park is great. I'm not picking on dog parks. It's a great idea to have a dog park, but we've got to go this route before we can go this route. And it's all about getting us, help us get more financially healthy so we can do some of these, these things. I think that's really vital, and that's where we're going with this decision tree down the road. And, and it's, it's interesting because as you put your agenda together. It's not a bad idea to say, here's the values it connects with. You know, here's the mission, here's the vision, here's how this fits it. What we want to do though, is just create a more objective system so it has a point value to it. Because everything's going to fit it. When people want, you know, what, who's, everything that comes up, somebody's going to say it's going to improve quality of life somewhere. <laughs> I mean, you know, every, it's all going to improve quality of life and it's all going to have integrity. So now it's, to what degree, how do we prioritize these things? Facilities master plan? We've got our consolidated field office complex under construction. Yeah, that, 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 by the way, is another thing that we find cities miss. They don't plan out how much capital requirements are we going to have. Like I asked you the fleet question. How many new police vehicles are going to do? How many this? And what's really cool in the fire area, and, and Ken, is vehicles are getting smaller, not bigger. Because what you're finding with cities now shrinking streets and with technology, you're finding that some vehicles can do the same thing but smaller size. It's like phones, it's like computers, it's like everything else. So you are seeing um, different sizes of emergency vehicles come out where they're not all one size. And it's, it's pretty cool, actually. And the reason they're doing it is because streets are narrower. More tr people are putting more trees in in narrowing streets. You put more trees in narrow streets, giant trucks can't, can't get, get through some of these. So you've got, of course, somebody smart enough said, we're going to make a smaller truck then. We're going to do this type of thing. Um, master plan, some of the same things. We've tried the top one, but for political reasons, nobody wants to partner with us. No, I, 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 it makes so much sense. That's why nobody does it. It's sort of like somebody's got to give up something. i give you an example. Um, uh, about five, six, seven years ago, I thought homelessness in my area was important. So I actually sent two people to, to um, San Antonio for a week because they're like the mecca of figuring out homelessness. And they came back and I said, what did you learn? They said, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to have centralized case management. So if you centralize case management, because then that person can sort of put where they're at makes a lot of sense. So I met with everybody that provided homeless service that had a case management, and guess what they all said? We don't want to give up our case manager. So check that off, that didn't work. Second thing was same software system. So you have the same software system. So you know, we always say we feed our homeless so well we have an obesity problem. Anyway, so, because everybody wants to feed people. Anyway, so you come in and you get a free meal here, and then you know at 9 o'clock you can get a free meal here, and at 11 o'clock they got a buffet at this church, and at 1 o'clock you can go here, and then 4 o'clock you can head here, and, and they sort of figure this out. Well, they have a software system that tracks where you're going. So when you show up at the second place, they say, I'm sorry, and they figured it out. So I even offered to pay for the software tool, and they said, no, we don't want to share that. So it is hard. It is hard to do that stuff. I've not had success. Uh, how about staffing levels? Are you f f comfortable with those? We, we do that every year during budget, uh, but w we're going to dive deeper into that this year. 
I, I think you have to, because one of the things that we're finding, if there's only, what are the benchmarks? So your, your city, your population, your mileage, how many police officers should you have? How many fire people should you have? If your parks, you know, and I think we've got, public entity has to get better at benchmarking. And, and, and that's, that's exactly what this one was. We, we have not done a whole lot with that. So I and think one of the things we want to capture is that, because I think when we get done here, we, that's, that's vital. That's a must have today. And that's where the city council needs to know what's the report card. How do we compare to other, other cities and so on in that way? Explore. In these last four, we, we've made some progress on this. The annexation discussion is something that will come out of this. You just got to be careful. This, yeah. Can you afford it? Right. That's for the first time people are saying, eh, we don't think so. You know, it's, it's got to work financially for you, um, I would think, unless you can take the money from somewhere else. Um, these are annexation, right? Yes. Uh, did you do anything with the city owned RV park? Not yet. Is that a, pri a, a chance for a pri Because these are becoming pretty profitable. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we're, we're actually looking with the half cent sales tax. That was one of our projects to explore. Or, I mean, there's, these are getting really mm -hmm. profitable. And it's not, when you say RV park, it's pretty high level RV park. It's like driving a little condo to the lot. I mean, it's, it's pretty full. The one on Pensacola Beach has just been packed ever since they built it all, all private. Um, Options, golf course buildings, just so everybody knows. Yes, we've looked at that. Some of them need, need to be demolished, and okay. we're, we're looking legally at Legally acceptable method to inform residents. I like that, legally acceptable. That's a strong word, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the <crowd game. laughs> yeah. um, I'm not sure how far we've gotten with that one. How about street lights? Smart street lights. That's a partnership with Gulf Power, and They're they sure. haven't. Well, we're anything fine. with that. I don't know what you're finding, and this is a personal opinion. I'm probably, Peep Golf Power is listening. They're probably going to be mad at me. I'm finding since they are bought, there's, they're, like anybody that gets bought, there's a transition period when somebody gets bought, and we're finding the same things. There's some, some things that they just don't know themselves right now because with the change in ownership, um, you know, we, we're finding that out in, 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 in daily living. Because they were a tenant of ours in one spot, and they're not going to be a tenant anymore. They've always bought a billboard at a, the ballpark. They probably don't know if they're going to come out a billboard. So we're going through that whole transition period with them now being in different ownership of where that changes. I don't know if it's good or bad. It's just real different right now. Um, anything here? That discussion is just beginning. Okay. So I think the other thing, how often do you bring the progress back on this and connect it to this? Unfortunately, we were only doing it about once a year. I would think almost you, on a monthly basis, somewhere they should at least say, here's what you told us to do, and this we're not touching because of this reason. This is we're sort of moving. Because I, I think this is something you just, I don't know if it's monthly, it's every two months, but I don't think you can wait every year to get progress. Is, is that, would you city council that are currently sitting, Mike, would you agree? Yeah, Dick? Yeah. Keep it in front of you. Because I, I find what happens is you don't keep it in front of you until you have to keep it in front of you. And then, and then we're not as aware of it, so we're playing, playing catch up. And again, these are why we're doing this. And I'm really impressed with, um, I guess you're Mr. Beatty. Anyway, um, but I'm really impressed with Mr. Beatty here um, doing this and having these and having him so frank. There was no, oh, Quint, don't bring this up. Oh, Quint, do that, or so on. So um, he asked me to. The, uh, with the last one there on alternate ideas for cable TV and internet. Since you get the opportunity to get a, have you seen a way to help bring this service into a community? And the latest I've heard is I guess they're coming out with the 5G uh, yeah. service and it may actually make some of these services <laughs> obsolete because you'll be able to basically power everything in your house off of your cell phone or the 5G service. W Any feedback on that that the city Yeah, that's use? exactly where it's all going. And I, I think a couple things I would ask you to do. Um, Lafayette, Louisiana is a player in this, but we'll get you some names if you don't mind. The other thing is, and again, this isn't a political statement, but this is something that um, Congressman Gates is all over. So one of the things I was hoping Triumph would do is sort of look at funding these types of things. 
because I know maybe it doesn't create jobs directly, but I think it sort of does, and that's not Matt, that's Don. But um, I do think, for example, um, Congressman Gates has been very aggressive in Pensacola, meeting with business leaders to help go the 5G. So I, I, would, I think he has that same, yeah, he's your congressman too, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, but I'm saying he's very knowledgeable of it. He's on it, and he's, it's sort of something that he likes. So I would also contact Congressman Gates and get yourself in that top of the mindset. Does that make sense? We have uh, one of his aides, Laura, has yeah. reached out to us, and, and that's who we've started the conversation And that's with. what she's doing. They're sort of pulling this and being in, and he had a meeting, a couple meetings in Pensacola with small business people, because he needs to make the case how important this is. And it is the most, one of the most vital things in small communities. What hit me talking in Alabama is some of those small communities, people now are trying to go to college or finish up high school or take training programs. We've talked about this once, I just want to repeat it, online. And they can't continue their education online very easily if they can't be online or they get kicked off all the time. I think it's from a educational learning and I think healthcare is going that route too. But by the way, if you're, you're unfamiliar, the biggest growth in healthcare is not hospitals and physicians, it's phones. It's, it's telemedicine. If you've read, and it works, and I'm not against it whatsoever. Um, if you read um, the New York Times this Sunday, they did a review of Eric Topol's new book on artificial intelligence and healthcare, how you can use your, your phone for some things. He's got a new book out. Um, I think the Wall Street Journal had something on it this week. Um, but if you're going to manage your health online, you better be able to be online. And how they can monitor you online, monitor your home so you don't have to be in the hospital or that. So I, I think, Terry, Terry, the, the, the connectivity is just, it's, it's no longer a nice to have. I think it's got to be a core service if you look at a community right now. Does that make sense? It does, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's not a nice to have, it's a must have right now. If I was looking at, you talk about re, you know, a downtown connectivity, co work space can't exist if you don't have good connect connectivity. Anything else? Okay, um, I'm going to go to, whoop, I'm going to go to, whoop, I, I'm sorry, I want the one with the line. You know that one? So um, Michael asked me for everybody who haven't heard this, and I'm going to go very quickly, just do a thing on change, because that's what you're going through. You're going through change. And then when we come back next time, we'll have, be able to dig into every one of, every one of these. So... Um, I'll go through this real quick and then get the other one revved up, okay? So, so anyway, but as we wrap up today, and especially for you running for office, which I know in the elections next, how many people, is there five candidates for four spots? Is that what I'm sort of just counting here? Okay, so, so the good news is four of you will be back, and, ho hopefully, and hopefully the fifth one will be back too. Um, we, we, we sort of found that when we were doing our, our community education thing called Civicon, Everybody running for office was showing up at every one of these lectures. And after the election, it was interesting who kept showing up. And we sort of said, well, you could sort of told who, who, had, real, who had real interest, because they, they kept coming. So let, let me walk through some, some organizational change from Cotter, especially for those who haven't seen this. And Michael asked me to go through this. There, there's five phases, and this phase will last if you have this, if you have this, if you have that. And, and that's the honeymoon phase. You know, everybody feels sort of good, and I'll go through that. Next is reality sets in. Well, gee, we can't afford <laughs> this. We can't afford that. Or I really like the Commerce Park. I really like downtown. I really like core services. Something's got to give here. And the uncomfortable gap is making that tough decision on what gives and what doesn't give. You're going to go through that also with your employees. I'm just going to be real straight. As you raise the bar in performance, you're going to have some employees that aren't ready for the journey. As you start tightening up your accountability, tightening up your metrics, no longer today, thank God I got a job in the government, I have a lifetime job. That's how they used to think in healthcare. When I was president of the hospital, I was putting pressure on a guy, and he came up to me and said, I just want you to know, I'm going to retire from here. I said, that might not be your option. 
<laughs> you know, this, this isn't a lifetime, a lifetime appointment here because you work in the police department or the fire department or the utility department. And, and if you don't deal, uh, if you don't, we'll do this one, then I'll go to that one. If we don't deal with that gap, and I think it's real important for city council to hear, because if you start raising the bar, and, and Dick, you were here when I talked about that last time, you're going to start hearing from some employees that aren't going to like where this is going. There's going to be, I guarantee you, how many police officers do you have, Tracy? 46 sworn. Huh? 46 sworn. Yeah, I don't care if this guy walks on water, 46 people ain't going to like this guy. Okay? I bet you about 40 will. And if he creates change, 40 still might, but six ain't. And those six ain't. And if you don't make tough decisions on those six, they'll start wearing down the rest of the, the 40. And I think that's some of what you've seen over the last year with some shake here. It's as your managers through training started holding, wouldn't you say, Terry, more accountable, more feedback, we so on. Because you want to get to consistency. And, and the challenge with any company is inconsistency. When this person handles it, they handle it this way. When I, I you know, I'm going to get a permit and I hope to God they're working today. I know that feeling. Because <laughs> it'll go a lot easier if they're working versus their worker. You know, here comes this inspector. I'd rather have this inspector. And inconsistency kills a city because it kills confidence and trust in the city and, of course, leading the results. So, so what to expect in any type of positive change? Even you're going to find the city council is going to have this. You're going to have minimally, possibly, you're going to have minimally, what, three new members? Yeah, three. So you're going to have three new members for sure. Well, there's going to be a sense of excitement. Oh, God, you're our guy, MG, or you're our Ryan, you know. You're going to straighten out this whole place, aren't you here? And there's going to be that, and we got the right to-do list now, and things will get better, and hope reigns, and, and you'll bring some new fresh ideas and some quick fixes because you bring fresh ideas. And, and what we're trying to do here is build that emotional bank account in the community. I mean, you know, that we are doing good things. And Dottie talked about it over and over again. You have so much wins. Don't run to the loss without maximizing the win. Like you said, John, you, you said something really strong, and, and, and Michael said it too. Your downtown's almost starting to get momentum now that you don't have to prime it as much as you had to prime it probably six years ago. Would that be an... A, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's that, you, you built that emotional bank account. You want to hardwire key behaviors, what you're looking for. You want to reward and recognize, and that's something we find misses a lot in, in cities and organizations. Um, you, you have an accountability system, right? How, how do you guys, do you think you, you, on a one through 10, Quint, we have this accountability system to hold people accountable, and we do it, that's a 10. One is we got the software, but we don't open it up. Where are you? I said we're probably about a six. Six. There's still definitely some inconsistencies across departments yeah. and trying to get that mesh together. We're making progress. But that's, if I'm a city council member, I want that six to be an eight or a nine a year from now. Yep. Because if we don't have that accountability system, we're going to have that inconsistency. Now, we're having an open, frank conversation, and I'm asking the, the, the city to be very open. And I think you're very fortunate people are this honest. You know, this, and that's why you compliment people for, I, I tell people in my articles, the number one thing of good leadership is self-awareness. You know, let's not con ourselves. Um, let, let's look at it. David? Talk about some of the challenges that the directors have with cities that you're familiar with or organizations you're familiar working with, with the keeping the, the team members that, that work below them accountable, but at the same time having a shortage of team members. Yeah. Well, I think what happens, and this is really going to be tough, if you hold on to people you shouldn't hold on to because you got a shortage, you'll never get rid of your shortage. So sometimes you have to get worse before you get better. And I know it's going to cost, and, and I'm real straight. If I'm a police major, and I know i got to deal with this employee, but if I deal with this employee, I'm going to need some more overtime, or I'm going to need some agency, and I'm now convinced, convinced that I'll be in trouble with, with Michael, because everybody's looking at my overtime, I will rationalize not to make the tough decision. That's good. That's good. Now, if the major comes in and says, 
I got to make a tough decision. Either I keep this individual, and, and we're not saying just when, you know, we're saying we've got documentation, we've got performance issues, we've got to make the decision. What happens is in a tough employment market, we don't make those tough decisions because we know things are going to get worse before they get better. And that, that, that's the challenge, the picture that you just painted. Right that's there. the challenge. That's the challenge, I believe, for our, our directors and our staff. And I think they fall into that trap. They don't have the conversation. So they just assume, because they don't want to make the tough decision either, because mm -hmm. this kid might, this person might coach their kid's baseball team for all I know. You know, they, they're never going to go away. You know, they go to my church. That, the beauty about living in a small community is you know everybody. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage of living in a small community yeah. is you know everybody. You and, and want to discredit taking action. I just believe you have to take have all the directors in here. You have to take action. I've heard different times from different departments that we got to take action, but it's a, it's a realistic challenge. When it's a challenge because we're you're looking for labor, but at yeah. the same time want to create accountability. Well, I think you have to have that open conversation. And I'm not saying it has to be at a city council meeting, but I think that conversation has to be, let's just say for now um, that you're running the police department. Yes. And you have to be able to go up to, who do you report, who's the police chief going to report to? Mr. Beatty. Mr. Beatty. I need to go up to Mr. Beatty and say, I'm going to have to make a tough decision. And right now, that means our overtime is going to go up. That means we're going to have some extra expenses. And I will be over budget. I will be over budget until I can find this replacement. I just need you to know that. Now, what would you say? We actually went through this. <laughs> we, we had this discussion, and we worked it all out. And we knew with everything we went through over the last year, it was going to get worse before it got better, and it did. We were, what, eight short? Ten, Ten at one time. And we knew it, but the tough decisions that needed to be made were made. And then what happens is, I know this is hard to believe until you go through it, you now will start attracting people because those people aren't there anymore. Uh, I went through this in Louisiana. A guy was driving me to the airport, and he said, I drove you to the airport because I want to talk to you. He said, um, I'm a small hospital, and, and I got one pharmacist, and this person's bad. You know, not bad. They're not like they're giving bad drugs but they, nobody wants to work with that, okay? And he said, but I, I, I don't, if I get rid of him, I gotta like hire an agency, which is gonna cost a fortune. And I said, yeah, but you're not gonna attract other people to the department as long as he's there. So you're gonna have to make that tough decision, but somebody's gonna have to say, it's gonna get worse before, usually financially. I'm not saying morale gets worse, by the way. Morale can actually get better. Sometimes working let with, out that difficult person it, morale gets better even when you're short, but you have to be willing to make those decisions. And that, you're, you're right. That, and I think people do it subconsciously, especially now, with a shortage of talent. Well, I might as well stick up with them. They're not great, but I don't know what I'm going to get elsewhere. Does that answer there? Probably more detail. Yeah, I really wasn't looking for, just while we had everyone in the room, especially all the directors, and encourage them to take action. Yes. But at the same time, it's a challenge. Yeah. And so, I think that's where we're at now. That's kind of the reason why I threw the six out there. It had to get worse before it got better. Yeah. I'm seeing the changes with the new chief coming in, some of the initiatives Michael's put out to deal with pay yeah. classification. I think it's going to turn around, but it, we took a hit, and it's going to take some time. Did to you get take a hit morale-wise, or did you take a hit financially? I think both. I think they're what, waiting to see what's going to happen. What do you think, Tracy? Both. Both? Why do you think morale? I, I think a lot of it had to do with earlier going back to retention is paying benefits and the city has stepped up so far and said okay we're going and there's sometimes fear don't you think tracy the people that don't want change throw out fear well and i'll steal this from somebody from prior chiefs too the two things police officers don't like is change and the way things are so and that's <laughs> true for myself i mean that's just I love the way that. human is. Okay, I'm going to use that. Sure, I stole Thank it from you. somebody. So, uh, There's no revenue sharing here, right. though. I know no, you. Yeah. <laughs> so, but with that being said, we, you know, with the new pay and classification study, which is a lot of yeah. the new officers are seeing, you know, hopefully this is going to come out and that's going to be able to. Yeah. And I'm not saying you don't document. Because the other big challenge, and that's why um, Michael's been so good about offering training, but probably that's how we almost met a couple of years ago, um, bringing training in. Because the biggest issue is lack of documentation. I think if you ask Terry when somebody comes up to him and says, I'm having trouble with this employee, and you pull their personnel file, what's usually in it? Perfect evaluations. <laughs> yeah. 
and, and we're just having an open, honest, and this is not city, this is life. When we go into organizations, we'll ask them to rank down their employees that are not meeting expectations. And they don't know exactly what we're going to do with it. And we say, we're not going to like post it. Then we go to human resources, and we say, can you pull these files? And we find 49% of people have nothing in their file to give you any indication that there's a problem. So sometimes you have to start over. You can't go back. Because, you know, I should have gave you a verbal warning eight years ago, a written warning four years ago, and our city attorney here in a few minutes is going to talk about that. Um, well, to kind of piggyback, I mean, the other thing that goes into the fear, and I represent several cities and businesses, is the fear of lawsuits. You know, so yes. everybody to your point of documentation. So when you go to Terry and they're saying, hey, we want to let somebody go, but we've got this issue. And that goes towards the financial part too. So not only are you getting hit financially because now you got to litigate over it, you, you've also got those. So, so I think that also adds to the decision-making process because I've had those conversations with, you know, administrator, administrators with Michael and say, look, you know, at this point it may not be the time. You know, now we've got to start tracking those things. And what we find is somebody has a habit of poor performance, they'll quickly bust through all those things quite quickly. You know, one of my favorite stories is we were meeting with a person and they hadn't done a very good job. So the, the legal counsel was, you cannot fire this person, but you can give them a final written warning that if anything else happens, they'll be fired. So, and one of the reasons they were firing them because the person threw temper tantrums in the workplace and threw stuff. Okay, so they sat. You, Hayward. They sat with this person, walked through this file that they probably, if they hadn't done it, could have already gotten rid of this person because they hadn't. And said, "This is your final written warning." They got up, screamed, and slammed the door. Well, then that was the final one. <laughs> you know, but I, I think the documentation, and that's what we've been working real hard on here, because you also want to be value driven. You don't want to surprise someone. You want to make sure they have that opportunity to correct themselves. About, we find about a third of the people when they start getting held accountable who have not, who have performance issues, will start getting better. About a third of them, here's where you're real lucky right now because there's such a good employment market, they'll leave. You know, they'll leave. They'll go to another place because they'll, they'll get hired because, you know, people are looking for people today. And a third of them, you might have to let go. So it's not like you let a lot of people go, because out of 300 employees, you're probably talking 24 to 25 that are in this range. That's probably what you're talking about. If you look at national statistics, that means you got 200 something that are really good, and that's why we have to really do a lot of reward and recognition and roll out behavior standards. So there's consistency. You know, how, when, a, when a person um, goes and puts a permit again, when do they hear from the city? Uh, uh, for residential, within uh, typically three to five days, commercial. And they know that, right? Then, yes. So somebody says, within three to five days, you will hear from us. Mm -hmm. That's the type of performance standards you need. You know, will phone calls be recalled, returned? How, how, what are, and then the, every employee signs those, by the way, and say, here's what we're committed to do. And you will find they will because they understand that their life gets a lot better. These are things you do when everybody's feeling really good. We have a good set of behavior standards that just kind of show might, some examples. You might have them, don't you? You have them? Oh, do we have them? Yeah. yeah we, we do. I mean, we have policies. I was going to say, we, when we send them out as part of Quint's media package, we get calls all the time. People ask if they can reprint them. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm happy to we'll send them We'll get those, too. You know. These are a little more than policies. Right. It's very much how we're going to act. It's how you answer the phone. Day. It might be, you know, how you indicate, uh, you know, what's coming next, that sort of thing. But it's just a good thing to look at to see if you can brush yours up a little. So what phase two is what we've been sort of going through here a little bit. And I'm just bringing up to date over the last two years we've been here. A little we they. You know, some are getting it, some are not. You can get these between departments over resources. I mean, you were in the Air Force, right? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Some of you, you get the, you know, who's getting money and who isn't getting money, who's getting support. And, and you start, once you start getting better, you clarify the inconsistency. Because now you know what you're looking for, so it almost seems like it gets worse. It's bigger than I thought. This will impact me, and some are getting and some are not. Because you've got a big challenge here. You, you, you're getting ready to go through some of the most exciting times 
in the history of Fort Walton Beach. I mean, when you looked at what you've got sitting there, and that's why you've got things happening, messaging, you, you are ready. Whatever you go here, you, you are ready to go through some of the most exciting times to, to really put Fort Walton Beach uh, even more on the map. I don't know if any of you travel, but when I used to travel all the time, somebody would say, where do you live? And I'd say, Pensacola. And they'd look at me like, where's that? And I'd say, have you ever heard of Destin? Oh, yeah, we've heard of Destin. <laughs> Everybody's heard of Destin, it seemed, on that plane. And, and, and when I was coming into Pensacola, well, you want people now, some, somebody says, I'm from Destin, and they say, or San Destin. How about this, Seaside? And they say, well, you know, I don't know, Seaside. He says, well, it's by Fort Walton Beach. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. I've heard of that. So, I mean, you're, you're in a period that I think you've been getting ready for for like the last six years. You've stabilized your financials much more than they were six years ago, aren't they? Yes. You stabilized your financials. You, you've got more money than you need, not that you want, but than you need sitting there. You have access to capital. You, you have a good opportunity, and your downtown is, your downtown is moving, moving right along. So I, I think this is bigger, but, and some will get it and some will not, and this includes some in the community will not like this growth. Some people like things staying the same. Because if they stay the same, you're going to hear that. We used to be such a small little town, and now we're not. I used to know everybody, and I don't know everybody anymore. And I used to be able to get right to, from this place to this place in six minutes, and now it's going to take me 12, for crying out loud. And I used to be able to find a parking spot. Now I can longer find a parking spot. And you almost have to start to say, oh, that's too bad, but gosh, is that good? I mean, that, you know, it's almost like you have too much construction work. <laughs> and that's not bad. Sort it's not bad, but yeah. But sometimes you have to say no to people. Yep. And you have to say no to people you've done work for before. Yes. There's, it's just life. So then we go to phase two, which is, and you've been already through these, just so you know, you're, you've been, your training's getting more focused. We did a whole thing for your team on recruiting high performers. And we did training on how to keep those good people with you, because you, they're the ones that have the best chance to exit. Um, increase substance. We've we got to constantly grow the staff, like we have to grow the community. Um, we, uh, you, one of the challenges every community has, which I, I would recommend you do and we'll put in a strategic plan, increasing the civic IQ. How do you increase the civic IQ? Which means when you say we're going to slow down traffic, people say, that makes a lot of sense. When you say you're going to, um, do you know in Manhattan right now, if you're a restaurant, you can get rid of parallel um, parking spots in front of your restaurant temporarily. You can put a planter there and put tables on the street because you're looking for outdoor dining. Now, that's because they figure that out, that people want outdoor dining, and they're willing to give up some parallel parking spots in order to get it. But see, if people don't understand that, they just can't believe you're taking away parking spots. And you don't have many. Do you have one-way streets? No. Yeah. We have all these cities that have one-way streets, and they're going to have to go to two-way or they're going to die. And, and so what, what's happened is you've got to increase the substance to both the employees and to the community. And so I would hope in our strategic plan, Michael, we'll have a whole thing on growing the civic IQ, how to get the citizens understanding better what's going on. So instead of fighting it, they're excited about it. And let me tell you the key thing that drives them. They don't really care if you have a commerce park or not. They sort of like it, some do. They don't even care if you have an exciting downtown. Some will like it, some won't. You know what they'll all agree on? We want our kids to be able to live here. And these are tactics. What we're talking about today are all tactics to improve the quality of life in your community. Um, what to expect? It gets a little tougher. Decisions get a little harder wh when you get better. But you need to make sure you're improving your processes because you have a finite amount of money. So the question is, how can we get better? How can we use technology better? What can we do? We, um, Terry, or Tracy, right now in our apartment complex, just worked with the police and we privately paid for a new uh, camera system downtown because we're concerned. Because you get 390 people living downtown and they live close to what I call bars. Okay? And, and we, are unfortunately, you, I guarantee you don't have this in Fort Walton Beach. Do you have bottle clubs here in town? Not anymore, I don't believe. We have a bottle club downtown. 
That means if you're not familiar with the bottle club, when the bars close at 2 and you don't want to go home, you now buy your liquor and you go to a bar and you order a ginger ale and pour your liquor in it and you can stay open till 5. Now, Tracy, we have five police officers in the downtown area and between 2 and 5, where do you think all five are? <laughs> the bottle club. The bottle club. So guess where the bottle club is? across the street from the 390 residents. Now, nobody complained, well, they did, but not like they are now. So our residents say, well, you know, we're a little concerned. You know, there's a bottle club across the street here. And so we are working with the police, privately put cameras in, so, and the police have access, because we think if, in a matter of a few months, there'll be a lot of evidence that maybe this isn't a good thing, or at least they sort of operate. So um, inconsistencies. Stage three is where you've had to come, um, but you're still there, like you said, Tracy, Terry, I'm sorry, B because, because you're only six to out of ten on accountability. And if you're only six out of ten on accountability, this is where you are right now. And that's tough, because that's where you have to make tough decisions. But like you said, David, they're tough to make. That's why they're called tough decisions. But the good news is you've got some standardization going on and you're, you've created a gap. And you're creating a gap in even what people are wanting because you've, the Jets, Jets Stadium, now you go back to the old one, they ain't happy. <laughs> you know, when you start improving things, people sort of get used to, they forget real quickly what it was like. They just know how it is now. And then you get into phase three, which is we've been elevating training, getting here. And I think city council training is vital because if the, if the administration is moving quicker than you, then you're going to have disconnects. So I think the fact that you're here, you're invited to all the training. I think you invite the city council to all the training. And when you can make it, it's great because you want to know how the leaders are doing. And sometimes we even have right attitudes, but they're in the wrong place. I mean, I, can have a, I like having a friendly police officer, but I would like him to be skilled. You know, th those types of things. Um, and what to expect is we want to get into system-wide performance results. So we want employees to have purpose. We want people to want to be here in Fort Walton. Um, the organization, the city's changing for the better. What seemed to be impossible is being achieved. I think Winston Churchill or Nelson, one of them said, something seems impossible till it's achieved. I mean, how many years have you just driven through Fort Walton Beach, saw the Indian Mound here, a couple businesses here? And driven through, you didn't picture a great downtown. Today you have that opportunity. So you have a lot of opportunity in front of you, but I think it's more important now for the City Council to be aligned and consistent to do that. So let me walk through, whoop, do you have that other one real quick? I, I know we got seven minutes, but I just want to show you one thing real quick as we go through this process. And when we come back, we'll, we'll take all notes and we'll put a little more meat on this next time. But I think civic IQ is really going to be important here because you're going to be too on through too much change when you look at people understand. And they're going to be terrified of debt because you're talking about more money, right? right? You're not talking about putting more debt on, or are you? Uh, we actually just yeah, issued. Just issued. So that's, that's going to be out there. So let me walk through some change, and then I'll finish. I'm going to go right here. There's four phases that people live in. The first phase is, I don't know what I don't know. That's the perfect place to be, but you can only be in it so long. And you're really, really happy. This is the phase where brand new, remember when you first went into the, what, did you join the Air Force? Yes, I did. Were you excited? Oh, very. Very, very. That lasted for how long? Uh, until basic training. Until basic training. Because <laughs> all of a sudden you say, oh my gosh, can I make it? Am I good enough? Am I going to be able to handle this job? Some of you new council members are going to start off here. Very excited. Oh, cool. This is great. I'm on the council. This is good. And then all of a sudden, oh, my gosh. Next phase is I know what to do, but it doesn't come naturally. I've got to plan it. I've got to organize it. I've got to follow instructions. It's like how long you been in construction? 35 years. 35 years. When I was in college, I drywalled if you need help. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> and you know, putting that tape up, oh my God, I, it was terrible. 
I mean, it's a hard job when you have never done it. And you're trying to put the, the, you know, the, the wood up, you're trying to get, and getting the, the right texture to the thing. And you watch somebody that knows how to do this, and it's so good. Mine was so bad, okay? And, and because, uh, but I was here. So I knew the steps to be successful, but I hadn't done it long enough to be really, really good. At 35 years of construction, you do some things in your sleep almost that a new employee will take a long time to do. In a community, what happens is you get to here, here, but this is where I'm going. Then you get people that are very proficient in their skills, but I'm gonna change it. If I had to change these right now for a community, you get people that sort of don't know what a great community looks like or what right looks like, and then all of a sudden they know, wow, we're not it. So when I, in 2004, went to Asheville, it was very evident, we're not it. Portland, Maine, we're not it. Savannah, Georgia, we're not it. You know, um, Omaha, Nebraska, we're not it. Now, could we get there? Yeah, but we had to learn. We brought in Ray Gindros from Urban Design out of Pittsburgh. You know what he said? You need to shrink your streets, you gotta slow down traffic, and you gotta pick a one intersection and make it great. And if you can get two out of four corners great, that's good. If you get three out of four corners, that's great. Because sometimes you don't get all four corners. And if you've been to Pensacola, that's called Palafox and Maine. Where 10 or 11 years ago, that was two empty buildings that had been empty for over 30 years and two empty lots. So Ray sort of, but everything was natural. Stay within a scope. Don't get too spread out. He sort of helped us with that. And then you get proficient skills where you sort of get it. But you have some people in this town that are here, but you're going to ask them to go back here. They're used to the community being like it is, and they're used to their social standing where it is. They're used to their influence where it is. And also, when you create change, even your people that you think should love change are going to push back sometimes because they don't have that same city council person they can get the year to. All of a sudden, the decisions are being made that they can't influence, or they're even wondering, am I going to be that successful here? That's what makes downtown so hard. You know, I was on the board of a chamber, but people want new jobs, but new companies, but not something to compete with them. And you have to get to the point where you move from a culture of scarcity to that you're going to grow the pie. And what Fort Walton Beach is doing right now is you've made the decision to grow the pie. You've not made the decision to contain your growth. You've made a decision to grow the pie for all good reasons. More tax revenue means more people. Or more people, more tax revenue needs more support for police, more supports of fire, better school district because you have more money to put in, and it also means more sustainability. And that's why these decisions that you're making over the next two to three years, I think, I think you said it from the start, are going to be decisions that are going to impact Fort Walton Beach for 30 to 40 years. And that's why it's so hard to be an elected official, because you could actually make a decision which would cause you not to be reelected, possibly. But it still might be the right decision, by the way. So I think great elected officials put the community above themselves. And from what you said this morning, I think that's exactly what we already have and what we're, we are going to have. So thank you very much for this morning. I appreciate it very much. I just wanted to go through that because it's going to shake a little bit. Michael, any closing comments? No, that's it. Um, I don't know if any of the council members or candidates have anything to add? We can go around the room. Yeah. Are we? So we're in the beginning. I do like your comment. <coughs> I do like your comment on the proficiency, or the profic proficient in skills. Uh, you know, a lot of us do work to get to our position and think we're very good at our jobs. But we forget that there's improvements after that. Yes. Uh, I see a lot of construction, you know, a lot of the old builders always want to do it the way it's always been, but technology and products have changed and they can't change the new products so they never worked with them. Yes. And they don't realize there's a benefit in doing that. Yeah. So I, I don't. And they get scared. I think we get proficient and complacent. And we, and we get scared. Yes. Because if we try to do, the, the biggest scared group right now in the United States are physicians. Because they put in an electronic health record, so they have to do everything differently today. And now they're, the older physicians are terrified <laughs> 
of this, can I adjust? It's different, and it's, it's hard. And you're going to get people that are going to surprise you by pushing back on things you don't think they should push back on, but it's the nature of the beast. I think you couldn't have, I think you said it better than anyone. Thank you. I want to thank you for putting me in the second dot right there. <laughs> know what I don't know, which is good, because yes. uh, when I started thinking about what am I going to do, I mean, if I'm just going to take on this job, and uh, I just knew that, hey, I love this city, I'm going to do the best that I can, and I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen, but there is a reality. There's a lot of things on our plates. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer in you got to have your base, you know, as they say, the hierarchy of needs. You got to have your public safety, and then you build upon that. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I, I think everyone in this room agrees, wouldn't you? Yes. Michael? Yes. Yeah. You can't sacrifice core services. And you probably have a little bit, some periodically. Yeah, then define core services, right? Um, yeah. I really like the uh, concept about after we leave these three or four or five sessions, however many we need, the, the um, accountability measurements, the, the rubric, the report card, however you want to uh, identify it, as well as revisiting it, whether it's I think I heard some input on, on quarterly or monthly or somewhere in between, so that not only we can have accountability, but making sure we're supporting staff and supporting everyone in what we collectively decided to strategically plan about and invest this time that we're spending with, with Quint and all of us here. But the, uh, the report card, the benchmark, I, I, I really hope and looking forward to leaving here so that we are revisiting it, keeping accountability, as well as supporting what we've collectively come up with and, and doing that regularly, somewhere if, if, between monthly and quarterly. Yeah, if you haven't read my book, I have a chapter in there called Consent Versus Consensus. And it's really important for city council members who don't get their way to still say, I, w I don't think I, but I'm still going to do everything I can to make the decision successful. And that's the challenge you, you have in any organization. John? Uh, I think it's been a real uh, productive morning. Um, one, one thought uh, that hadn't been the focus of today is I know, uh, being selfish for a minute, when I uh, step, step aside uh, in the coming days, um, I'd, I'd like to and I've been thinking for a while, figure out a way to enhance our community involvement. Because I know in the past I've been disappointed with our budget meetings and, and all those meetings that we don't have a lot of community involvement. I'm not on social media, so I don't get the Facebook messages. But, but perhaps that's also something we can put into our thought process as to how to get, I know Ms. Jameson talked about wanting to be involved in the Leadership Council. I know I want to have uh, not, not a direct role, decision-making role, but I, I want to have a, a continue to help the community so I'm hopeful that when we do these plans and think for the future that that can be a part of y'all's thinking is how to engage and, and, and bring the public into the duties of, of, of assisting y'all to run the city so um, hopefully that can be a part of it. A big part of your strategic plan is going to be how to increase civic engagement. You know how, how do you have intellectual growth, how do you have great government services, and how do you have civic engagement? Those are the three buckets. And what we learned, John, is the civic wants to be engaged, but it might be a little different, but they do. Because not everybody says, let's go to Washington today, or let's go to Tallahassee, because we get too many fights. But locally, we can all agree on most of this stuff. So I think, John, you hit it. And, and I think there's a pent up need, but you gotta figure out how to fill that need. So I, I think you're gonna have a, a huge chunk of this plan will be how to get the civic IQ up is what we call it. And you can make a change locally, and it's harder to in the national stage. But yeah. yes. But, but, I, but yes. as a council person, I, I found it very difficult because I didn't get any community involvement unless I called a, if we're working on a fence with a parks and rec facility, call a friend that Unless it's a that. controversy, you're not going to yes, get them and there. So ho hopefully that yeah. I can be of assistance, but in general, we can help to <laughs> bring that as part of our future is, is reaching out to those that aren't on the council to, to help us or help, help you to make those decisions. I was speaking at a city and it was cold and snowy and I was going to the city council chambers and I was thinking this is probably like Spinal Tap where you go in and there's like six people and, and as I turned the corner the city council was just full 
that you know a place that sits 250 they had 300 they had rows of waiting and a city council said I haven't seen anything like this since the roundabout discussion <laughs> and, and I went in and said probably you thought it was the roundabout discussion today huh so I, I think I think we have to get people there not because they're upset it's because they want to learn I agree thank you Amy other than what's been said has that been my sentiments exactly and I always love listening to you because I always learn and those of you that have not read his book on community involvement, it is a really good book, especially if you're going to be sitting in this seat in a few more weeks. So I would highly recommend it. We've used a lot of building analogies today, but you can't build anything without a strong foundation. And this is foundational. Thank you. It is. Mike? I agree. I echo everything. I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the system that you put in place where you can you're proactive for the problem when it gets here, but we're yes. going to close the school and you have the criteria that makes it easier. Right. It'll make, it'll make their job easier whenever they get to that point. Yeah, I think that's vital. And, uh, and, and planning for the what if, you know, what if this happens, which I, I think we've done a lot of that. Uh, I think what we've seen, maybe we need to go a little further on some of it. And as far as training, if you think it's expensive to train, see what it's going to cost by not training. I, I agree. I can, yeah. and, and I know that. And again, I, I always appreciate the what we get because a lot of what we get from you here we can use in our everyday businesses or whatever activities we are. I think your challenge right now is your city administration has too much things in the funnel. It's a you know mile wide, couple inches deep some places, and I think the challenge for us over the next three to five sessions is to prioritize what's in that funnel, and then as as you said, David. Get supportive so if somebody has to say no, you don't say, well, I was for it, you know, this is up to me, you do it. And so I, I think that, Mike, you hit it. I, I think there's, you, you got too much opportunity. Sometimes you have too much opportunity. You, you don't know what to say no to. And I don't, I'm not telling you what to say no to, but we have to figure out a criteria so when you s prioritize, you, you feel better about the prioritization. You have to have a definitive goal to get there. Yeah. To know what you're, you know how to drive and get there without going. Right. Being run. Absolutely. Nathan? Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Mr. Beatty for being progressive enough to, to have this meeting together. You know, there's a lot of places out there that are not even thinking about About 99%. Yeah, there, well, there you go. There, you, you know the odds. So uh, thank, thank you and, and for also bringing the, uh, the candidates in. Um, on this, uh, it, I mean, it's it's important to to get in, you know, early, and uh, it's like pre-orientation here, so. surely. And I'm glad you came, because you know you, this sounds this city's moving quick enough that you're going to have to move, sort of get in with your feet moving a little bit. Yeah. So. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Ryan. This is really fun for me. I'm uh, I'm really big on training, and even this kind of training is a low impact training. It's just everybody in a room talking. Um, obviously everybody has the same goal to make Fort Walton a better place. Um, just like my comment earlier with the, the school resource officers, not to highlight any or imply any inefficiencies, but it's just to highlight to how important training is and how, how much it's needed. I mean, I have three pages of notes on here and, and doodles in the side just because I'm really big on that. Um, big thing like John was saying with uh, community involvement and, and getting them educated and keeping them involved. Uh, one of the things that always sticks out in my mind when I worked in, in the emergency room, people are more willing to sit in the ER for three hours if you come out and go, hey, the wait's going to be this long and just kind of give periodic updates. They're more upset when you don't say anything and let them sit for that same three hours. So keeping them informed of things and, and letting them know what's going on, even if it's the bad things, they're willing to work with you more and in, in, in understanding because they're involved. Um, I think, too, uh, Brian, I would call that... We sometimes wait till it's done to let people know because exactly. we don't want to raise expectations. It's you have to narrate, whether it's narrate the care, narrate the progress, narrate where you're at, or people feel forgotten. I don't if it's an ER or if it's in a store or if it's in a community. And I find too many people. Well, so I didn't. I wanted to wait till we got farther down the road before I said anything. We have to tell people early where we're going 
and then give them updates along the way. So thanks for bringing that up. Exactly. Um, the other thing that was big in my mind uh, that I kept hearing is, is the retention thing. And, and I know it's, it's, it's big in the emergency service. That's kind of the forefront because everybody sees that a lot, especially, mm-hmm. you know, they've got visible uh, mm-hmm. buildings and, and vehicles and things like that. Um, retaining those people, especially if you're turning over every two to three years, it's, it's really hard to keep good people in. And then you have those good people that can be role models for incoming people. Um, the biggest thing is, like she said in the back, you have mental health cases that sending the same officer out to those people. Uh, that's really important because you have people that have experience in, in a variety of different situations that may only come up every you know couple of months that you don't have these people that can then pass that knowledge on and, and know how to handle themselves in these situations. Um, so retention's a big thing. Right, Ryan, just to give you some research, even with homelessness. Yeah, yeah. With homelessness, if you have the same people dealing with the same case manager, mm-hmm. you're going to get much farther along. So I think retention, and the more I think about this, there's no reason why Fort Walton Beach shouldn't be the best place to work. Mm-hmm. And, and that means that if, if you're running a good, financially sustainable place, I never bothered me if our nurses were the highest paid in the city. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't think that was bad. I thought that was sort of good because we had lower retention, or high retention. Right. The reason we could pay more is because we weren't paying agency and overtime because we had the positions. But it takes a while to get there. And I don't think Fort Walton Beach should think they're less than any other city in, the, in this panhandle um, when it comes to great places to work. And you're so far ahead because you're having these type of conversations. And you measure it. Most, we recommend measuring employee engagement to every city we go into, and they're terrified to do it. They're terrified to do it. And yet you guys have done it before us. It wasn't our recommendation. You were already doing it. I can't think of another city we've been in where we've had the entire city council come. And I think that's so important for a couple different reasons. First of all, creating alignment. But most of all, creating this common language that you use moving forward. So when you use a word, everybody knows what you're talking about. It really just helps catapult things uh, much more quickly. The other thing on engagement, um, in one of the cities we're working in, we did a contest where we we sent out and said, we'd like to hear from you on what you think um, the best ideas for uh, businesses and programming is for downtown. We got 135 responses. And Anna White put together um, a program where she kind of optimized it by saying we really want to reward and recognize every single citizen who participated. So she put together a reception for them. They're part of a a placemaker group. They have t-shirts coming. I mean, we really piled it on the (coughs) tip because we want people to know that engagement is the key to everything. So if you reward and recognize engagement, they'll give you more of it. We did not reward the winning idea. We rewarded the engagement. Um, the other thing I'd say, I uh, was uh, worked with Quinn on a marketing project one time, and I came with probably about 50 terrific ideas, thinking he was going to be so happy. And he said, you know, working with you is like drinking out of a fire hose. Why don't you pick two things you think you can do really well? And got up and left. You know, I'd been up all night thinking of the ideas, so it just reminded me of when you had a lot of ideas. Sometimes just three that you can do really, really well and be known for those things is, uh, is valuable. As an idea person, it was really hard for me because I, I like a lot of ideas. Sometimes I don't like to execute as much as I like to think of the ideas. Ryan, anything else? No, that was it. Well, th- thank you all for being here. Thanks to the city staff, and thanks for this opportunity to be. Um, so someday, you know, we can say, well, gee, I, I knew them when. I knew them when. Because you have er- the moons of all aligned for you right now. It's gotten a little too crowded in some places. People are looking for a different... They're looking for more than just a white beach. They're looking for a place. And you've sort of got that. You've sort of got that. And you're the only one that sort of has it in a long geographic area. So I I think um, you really have, if you you have an opportunity to seize the, you have a a, a time to seize the opportunity. The question is, are you capable of seizing? And, And I would think you are. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to thank everyone for showing up, especially the candidates. Um, you know, we, we like to get, especially every two years, we like to get the current council and the the candidates involved in this process because it, it, it is the future of the city. Um, I will say that on John's point about getting more engagement, our experience over the last three or four years, you know, we, we, we 
form stakeholders groups for the big projects and get get a lot of engagement with that but unfortunately when we have our budget meetings and really when we have this type of meeting dean you're you're about the only staple that that shows up every time but we'll give you a t-shirt too <laughs> but you know uh unfortunately in our community the negatives usually are the ones that speak out um, we've got to figure out a way to get the positive because those that like what's going on and, and love the projects and love where the city's going, they don't feel like they have to say anything. They they just like where they're going and they, they sit back in their houses or enjoy the parks and everything we offer. We got to figure out a way to get them out. And that's what we'll do. And you know, we you have one of the best experts in the country and Dottie DeHart sitting in this room and you will have a big part of this. You know, if you look at your strategic plan, it has a lot of pieces. But I think really focusing deep on what we're talking about um, is, is where we can go. But I think some of the messaging that Quint said about change, you know, change is hard, change is tough, it's not easy. Y'all are the group that's, that are going to be tasked with a lot of those tough decisions. And you're going to hear, you know, people aren't going to like you. They're going to make comments about you. But hopefully, you know, we as staff, it's our responsibility to provide you with the information and educate you. You're responsible for making the decision that you think is right for the community. And I liked what I heard from everybody today. The staff you see on the back wall, I would recommend that you reach out to them and talk to them, learn what we do. Uh, like I said, we're, we're going through the task right now of listing all of our services and trying to figure out what, what our core services are. I would like to task the elected officials and the candidates what do you think are core services what, what what do you think are the city's core services and really start thinking that way so when we meet next time we, we can yeah. start start well, getting yeah. getting to and this part point. of it is just listing it's not saying they're all core services if you only could pick one what would it be two and and not that you have to get there but i, I always know for example if i know if I do get to where I have to make a tough decisions, I've already done the research on where they're at, they're a lot easier than just all of a sudden doing it. But other than that, thank you, Quint. Thank, thank yeah, you. It was a, a great session. Thanks and for the opportunity. Thank you.